space, and dimensions, and universes, all those sorts of things that men's minds are just, you know, they just grapple with, you know, wrestle with it. But his name is Stephen Hawking. He um, looks to be about like a middle-aged man. He's afflicted severely, though, with some sort of, you know, physical deformity sits in a wheelchair and I don't really know how they get his voice out of him because his mouth don't move, he has no expression, but you know there's some verbal uh, things that comes out of him that is under, understood. So, but you know, one thing that I really thought was uh, a curiosity to me in that programming and the presentation as it went through the whole hour, hour and a half, at the end of it, uh, the questions that he was putting to these people and these people to, you know, respond with answers. It had to do with the universe and the center of the universe. The center of the universe. And their conclusion at the end of that programming, and some of you may have seen this as well, but the conclusion that everybody that was being questioned and Mr. Hawking himself and, and all the you know, people concerning where is the center of the universe? And their conclusion was that the center of the universe was under your nose. What do you think about that? The center of the universe was under your nose. Everybody's nose. Your nose, my nose. And that was the conclusion that they came up with, that the center of the universe is under your nose. And so I got to thinking about the, how this thing comes full circle. You know, years and years ago, people used to think, and they believed, that the earth, the earth that they were on, was the center of the universe. And they taught that and believed that, and people who began to graduate a little bit in the, you know, the scientific realm of things, you know, began to consider that and just laughed at it and scoffed at it and thought, how preposterous is it that these morons out here would conclude that the world is the center of the universe? And so that went on for years and years and years. And now finally, supposedly, the most brilliant mind in the scientific field says that, no, it's where you are. Now, I don't know if that makes sense to you. I don't think it makes any sense to me except that, except that I will agree with this, that where I am, that's where the center of my universe is. It's where I am, okay? So forget it all the stuff. I just pointed that out to let you know that if you are in any way establishing yourself upon the theories and the, and the junk that comes up out of the world's minds, then you're apt to be in trouble, you know, because it's just shaky. It changes, like with the wind. But anyhow, if you would, uh, let me read to you out of Matthew, the 16th chapter. And started the sixth verse where Jesus said, This is Matthew 16 and 6, and we are going to speak a little bit here concerning uh, the house of the Lord and how it comes about. In verse number 6 here, if you have it, uh, maybe Tony can get it up for you. Matthew 16, 6 says, Jesus said unto them, He had his disciples concerned about, you know, not. Having, a, having enough bread. And Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, Well, the reason he said that is because we have taken no bread. And Jesus perceived, he said, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, what reason, what reason, or why reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets you took up? 
And how is it then that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the le but that you should be should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? And then verse number twelve says, Then they understood. They understood that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread. But beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. The doctrine, that's what you need to be aware of. Jesus was teaching them to beware of doctrine. And you really do, that's as much true today as it was then. And we'll follow on here just a little further in this reading. The Lord is going to now question his disciples in verse 13. He says, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some of them that you are John the Baptist, and Elias, and Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. You know, that's interesting to me that they would respond to his question in that manner. Some of them are saying, you know, a lot of people say lots of strange and weird things. But the Lord was standing there before them, and he asked them about what men are saying. And all these persons that uh, they brought up here, John the Baptist had been killed. He had died. Elijah... Now, Elijah was one person in the history of Israel that there is no record of his death. He was caught away. And Jeremiah was one of the prophets who prophesied to Israel right before their Babylonian captivity. And he was called the weeper, weeping prophet. But anyhow, at the end of it, he says, but I want to know who, whom say ye that I am? And really, church, if you want to know the most critical factor in the redemption of your soul and spirit and your body, it has to do with this question. Who do you say that I am? And again, we come, we come through this, this uh, that Jesus said to them about the doctrines of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're saying and they're teaching and there's teaching and saying and, and more, more times than not the things that they will be teaching will draw you further and further and further away from the central truth of who Jesus is. It's who Jesus is that matters and is what you believe your heart and your soul and your mind about Jesus that matters. And I will say this to you that Jesus, Jesus in his teaching and doctrine turned all the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees up on its head. And it's like if you can just let the imagery of a, of a bucket, just, you just take it and you just turn it over and shake it empty. That's what Jesus was doing in that day and time that he was, he was ministering to these people because, you see, this was about to become, there's a tremendous conversion or a change in, in the way things, uh, spiritual matters and spiritual things would be, be thought about and to be received. And the Lord is the introduction. He's the introduction into this new, into this new uh, spiritual birth, the creation, a uh, new creation that Paul later talks about that is going to happen inside the spirits and the hearts of the people. But what we are, what we have here is the Lord is beginning to lay a foundation. He's beginning to lay a foundation for the house of God. And as I said before, you see in this little bulletin that Jamie's got a little door and a, and a, little, a little picture here. And it says, as for me and my house. We, well, Jesus, 
Jesus is 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 the builder. He, he's the he, he's the uh, he, he's designed this thing. He has he has determined how it's going to be built and constructed, and it is his house. And further in Hebrews the third chapter, the scriptures will tell us that we are his house if certain conditions are met. Of course, what we see here is Jesus laying the foundation for the house of God. Now, as we go a little further here in this, maybe we're just kind of like, excuse me, like a flower opens up. This is the way this will happen. Verse 17, Jesus answered, oh, I'm sorry, verse 16. Let's read that one first. Simon Peter answered, and he said, Thou art the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And that's just the crux of the whole matter concerning this, is who is he? Peter responded that he was the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says to him, Blessed art thou, Simon, or Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed it. So here's one of the first instances through Scripture where, you know, you have Jesus here, but then you have the Spirit of the Father coming into a person and quickening into His Spirit. This is Simon Barjona's Spirit, a, re, a, a, revealed, a revealed thought, a revealed a bit of information about Jesus. And then the Lord just says, look, flesh and blood, it does not re it has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then in verse 18, he says, I say unto thee that you are Peter. And you know, the Lord uh, gave this name to Simon Barjona. He called him, uh, well, well, you'll see it here. He said, for, um, verse 18, he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And I understand that, you know, go around telling people, and it's a good thing to tell people, but at the end of it all, the, the thing that really matters is the revealed action, the revealed knowledge that comes, I mean, not from me telling you or somebody else telling you, but that you have sought this out, you've exposed yourself to the word of the Lord, and then, 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 God just comes into your into your spirit and soul and reveals to you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And even for us, in the day and time and generation in which we live, it's more than that. It is a revelation that Jesus Christ is the living Savior. That He, through the Spirit, reveals Himself teaches us about himself. And you know, uh, when Jesus was talking about you know, further to his disciples he said, you know, there will be a time where I will go. I will go but the comforter will come. The spirit of truth will come. And that's the, when he does come into you. And people people, you know, in fact you may not even fully realize it as, as the Lord begins to infiltrate and come into your spirit and life, you'll just see, you'll begin to see things gradually as you go along in your life a little different here and a little difference there. But what that is, is the spirit of the Lord that is leading you into all truth. And all truth is Jesus Christ. The spirit of God will lead you into that. Now, one thing that you need to be aware of, it's like Jesus said, beware of the leaven or the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees because that too will lead you, but it will lead you away from the central truth of who Jesus Christ is. 
You always have to keep your mind and spirit focused upon the, the one essential element here is who is Jesus Christ. And except the Spirit of God revealed that to you, it's, it's an experience of, of, of divine life is what that is. And you have to have faith, faith to believe this. You know, in uh, 1 Corinthians, let me see if I can uh, find the scripture that I wanted. It's in 1 Corinthians, uh, the second chapter. And tell me if you can find 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And um, just let me read a few of these verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 as we go forward here, verse number 1. It's Paul now, he's come onto the scene and he's, he's, he's writing this. And he says, I, brethren, when I came, excuse me, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but it was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So he says, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that comes to nothing. And I think that's a, maybe a second point there that, that needs to be made here is, is I started in the beginning of this talking about what is the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the world is is a, you know, it, it, it's fluctuating. I mean, it's, of course, you know, you have to say, well, give them credit. I mean, they're seeking to know. They're, they're trying to figure it out. But honestly, the you know, Jesus, the Apostle Paul said, look, the wisdom of man is not the wisdom of God. And God's, God's thoughts and his minds are not the thoughts of men and their minds. And so he's, he's making, you know, a comparison here between the wisdom that is of God and that wisdom then that is, you know, what we've all partaken, partaken of. We've read about it. We've thought about it. And most people in the world believe it. Most people in the world would deny God, that there is a God. And a lot of people even today deny that Jesus ever existed, you know. And so there you have it. But he said... Verse 7, he says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto their glory. He said, None of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And this is the part I'm trying to drill down to here. In verse 9, he said, As it is written, I have not seen ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. Okay? The things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But here's the revelation that Paul, Paul brings about here in verse number 10. As he says, uh, God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, even the deep things of God. And the one thing that, you know, I would, I would like to, you know, basically, basically just have, have uh, ministered to me personally. And, you know, if you're going to preach to me, preach Jesus. And preach that beyond all of, all of the, you know, this level of, of, of information and knowledge and stuff that, you know, in the world, I mean, it is from time to time an overwhelming pot. But beyond that, you know, if you're going to if you're going to reach out and go above and beyond that, Jesus is the one that's going to take you there. And God will do this through 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 revelation knowledge. His, he said, I'm building my house upon this rock. And this rock is Jesus. The rock is not Peter. See, Jesus was the, was the rock, the chief cornerstone. 
the Apostle Peter was a stone. He was, as he wrote later, in fact, I can read this to you in 1 Peter. He says, he says we are, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, uh, verse 4, he says, To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, but you as lively stones, you're built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in Scripture. He said, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. And so Peter goes on there in that text and he talks about, he talks about, you know, that, you know, we're... Um, you know, we're, we are the building and the, and the, the you know, the, the structure of the house of God. It's a spiritual house and each of us are, are alive, but not just in the flesh. We are living stones because the living God has, has, has brought revelation into us concerning who Jesus is. And so... You know, I just point this out this morning because it's, you know, it goes throughout the scripture. I mean, this message, the theme of it, the thread of it goes all the way through. And, and at the end of the day, when you're through, you know, with your meditations and your reading of your devotions and whatever it is that you have going on in your life, you just need to make sure, amen, that in your soul and spirit that there's one thing that is, that just, dominates and controls, amen, your, you know, the essence of who you are, and that is the faith that you have in the, in the Word of God, which is Jesus Christ. He right. is the Savior, and He is the Word that will give you life, will strengthen your life, and will help you, amen, from every day. And, you know, even through all the trial and the, and the issues and trouble, that people have that just seem sometimes you know you you hear about people that are just going through in, all, it's seemingly insurmountable things the 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 thing that is needed there is always strength from the Lord and power amen in your spirit your mind and soul it's the grace of God amen that keeps you and helps you and pushes you through to victory. And I'm thankful today that the victory that I needed in my life was given to me by Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.